So as a, as a member of the staff of FRAC Tracker, my main task is to use data to create maps that tell stories about impacts of oil and gas on human and environmental health. And I'm going to start this, this part of the presentation by something that I think could be looked at as sort of a proof of concept for what Matt just talked about. And I'm going to scale this back from nationwide to statewide. So what we're looking at right here is a map of New York State um, snapshot from around 2011. Now back in the mid 2000s, around 2007 or so, the oil and gas companies ramped up their efforts to start leasing land for high volume hydraulic fracturing. Nobody knew what was going on. I had helicopters, I had people at the door asking to lease my land, but we were pretty naive. Then in 2009, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation released their draft environmental impact statement to supplement some former um, environmental impact statements. And at that point, it really got on the radar of local communities that something might possibly be up. Working with some really smart attorneys, the, some of the towns in New York State realized that there was a good possibility they could implement home rule and make land use decisions on a municipal by municipality by municipality basis. So here in 2011, <coughs> we had about 11 or so communities that had, had passed bans saying, no, we don't want high volume hydraulic fracturing in our town. Those are the red communities. In um, purple are the moratoria. And in yellow, and this is an interesting one, are where I had just registered some uh, amount of discussion that was going on around, uh, around the topic. So fast forward three years, and we still didn't have a, a, an idea in the middle of that summer whether that home rule idea of um, restricting oil and gas development would actually hold up in the courts, but that was um, that did win in the Court of Appeals in June of 2011, and then by the end of the year, we had close to 200 communities in the state that had passed local bans and moratoria against high volume hydraulic fracturing, as well as a number. Of, okay, yeah. <laughs> As well as in the yellow, a lot of other communities that, that had um, been discussing the topic um, sometimes quite, quite vigorously. Well, to our great joy, the, um, the governor, in consultation with the commissioners of, of the environment and health in New York State in December, announced that they would be banning the process. And this was a, this was a great moment, but one of the things that was so important to me um, in that moment was the, the commissioner actually cited this map as showing the will of communities and the interests of communities to not go ahead with this process. So keeping that in mind, this is just my example of how visualizing data can actually, in, in the case of New York State, really did turn the tides on a process that looked um, almost inevitable, for the, at least for the southern tier. So as, as we've been discussing um, and will be discussing all this weekend, the amount of oil coming out of North Dakota and particularly the Bakken has really ramped up tremendously in the last six or seven years. And as, as Peter very eloquently spoke about the, um, the issues in the port of Albany, um, we're, we're feeling it in New York State. So this is just a map that shows a, an overview of where trains are coming into New York State, both across that northern corridor through Buffalo, Rochester, and down all, through Albany and down the Hudson, as well as swinging up through Pennsylvania, Maryland, um, to, to the ports. And there are hundreds of cars that are passing through. Well, when the issue started coming to the forefront in, in Albany. There was a really interesting article that the Wall Street Journal published in some maps showing potential um, what was going on inside that half mile or mile buffer zone. And I thought that I would replicate some of that for other communities across the northern tier of New York. 
and let's see, there we go. So here's what's going on in Buffalo. Buffalo is an example, I think, of a um, really serious, there's a serious environmental justice issue, particularly notable in Buffalo, where almost a third of the city's population lives within that half mile evacuation zone of where the trains are. <coughs> Buffalo's not a wealthy city by any means, it's coming back, but there's quite a bit of, of, of uh, poverty there. And that what that means is that people also don't have means to jump in their car and escape if there is some sort of an accident. There's a real issue with that. There are 28 public schools within that half mile evacuation corridor in eight private schools. And a friend of mine who used to teach in one of those schools said, yeah, we used to watch the train go right under the window. It went right by the classrooms where the, the physically and developmentally disabled kids were. So what would happen in that case? It goes past hospitals and several nearby colleges. And that goes straight through the center of that urban core. Likewise in Rochester, over a quarter of the city's population is in that evacuation zone and 20 K through 12 schools, hospitals, colleges. Sometimes the rail lines skirt the perimeter of the city, but it really doesn't mean that there wouldn't be an impact on the populations there. And also it goes right along the shore of Onondaga Lake, which New York State has been desperately trying to clean up and imagine what would happen if there were a spill there. And through Utica, which is a smaller amount of impact vis-a-vis -vis the number of schools that are in that corridor, but it's still um, over 25% of the city's population. So I know that now, especially since there's been so much pressure, a lot of communities are developing these evacuation plans. This is just an example of one that I pulled off of the internet for um, what Rockland County, New York, is doing on the, um, closer to New York on the Hudson River. And they've, it's, it's a large format map which isn't really displaying well at this, at this scale, but they have tried to um, show all of the potential risk locations, schools, hospitals, community centers, and so forth. So that's a good start. So when Matt and I, well Forest Ethics and Frack Tracker, it's a larger collaboration, um, but when we started talking, we realized that we have complementary missions. A lot of what Frack Tracker does is focus just on the, the data and the analysis, whereas Forest Ethics does have more of an outreach and advocacy um, role, but it makes us uh, really well suited to be partners in this. So based on that idea of showing what's going on on the community level and having that serve potentially as a um, encouragement and empowerment tool for other nearby communities to see how um, the response is. I developed this interactive map and um, this is just a draft version but I'm gonna be showing you some screenshots of the oil train response. So this is a map that is zoomable and clickable and different information comes up in the, um, the map as we go through. The green dots show communities that have passed resolutions um, opposing oil trains coming through their communities and the bright lines that you see there are the rail lines that crisscross the US and um, parts of Canada. Um, thanks to a lot of hard work from Forest Ethics, we have links that you can go directly to from this pop-up um, showing the text of the resolutions themselves and we're hoping that that can be a good tool for other communities who are interested in modeling um, similar resolutions based on that language. Zooming in a little bit more, we get um, additional detail, more of the lines show up a little bit better and then as we get in really close, you can see both the half mile and the one mile evacuation zone, um, as well as through the pop-up box, an approximation of the population numbers, the demographics of each of those areas in each of the cities. And um, we're hoping that that can also be a helpful organizing tool when approaching um, city governments to, to um, show what, what some of the um, effects might be. So I'm going to turn it back to Matt and wrap it up. Okay.